We are live, fellas. All right, now let me take care of it on Facebook because we're airing this on Facebook and on my YouTube channel. May the Lord Jesus be glorified through you, brothers. May the Spirit fill you and anoint you. Anoint your words to speak perfectly, clearly, and accurately. Save you from error and confusion. And may the Holy Spirit illuminate everyone who's listening with an open heart to hear another perspective because it's about the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, not for our egos in Jesus' name. So, brethren, let me just do this. Where the heck is this? I was supposed to put it live. All right, there we go. Now, brethren, I want each one of you to take a moment to introduce yourself because many of you are unknown to my audience. Subdeacon Daniel has been with me previously with William Albrecht as we were responding to Gavin Ortland on icons. So some may be familiar with you, but still tell people who you are, what your background is, and then we'll take it from there. So go ahead, brethren. Thank you, Sam, for having us. Uh, thank you for hearing us out on, on the topic. Uh, we're very thankful to you to be here. Uh, so I, uh, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Daniel Papish. Uh, I'm a subdeacon in the Syriac Orthodox. Syriac Orthodox. Uh, unworthy to be. Uh, I was uh, made a subdeacon by uh, His Eminence Mar Ogin in uh, 2018, January. And uh, my background, Sam was going over my yeah, back. My back. I'm still trying to get off the high horse uh, that I was on today. Uh, so yeah. my dad's side, the the tribe, the clan is EO. Eastern Orthodox. I was I was actually chrismated there, um, uh, and my mom's side, my mom's family is Chaldean Catholic. Uh, I was I grew born and raised, grew up evangelical. Um, I was in my uh, master's program at uh, San Diego State University, um, 2010, 2011, and then someone. A Catholic brother of mine, uh, Elijah Yassi, you guys might know him. He introduced me to the church fathers. I had no idea who the church fathers are. I never heard of the guys. I just thought after John, the Bible fell out of the sky <laughs> after Revelation. I didn't know Christians wrote things after that. So then I had the, I had the thesis going in. I'm going to find I'm gonna some find summarizing this really fast because that's not the point of the show. But uh, I had the thesis, the hypothesis going in that I'm going to find some kind of corruption eventually. And in the beginning, they believe what I believe. It turns out from the very first century, I realized I'm in trouble. And uh, I was in denial about it for two years. And then finally, I said, if I really believe Jesus is giving me his body and blood somewhere on earth, I will give everything I have to go Amen. and receive. And, um, and so I, it cost me my whole world at the time. I didn't know anything in the traditional apostolic churches or anyone. My whole world was evangelical, but Jesus is worth more than everything. Amen. So, so uh, I I went. Um, I uh, I was going to the Syriac Orthodox Church first because it was closer to me. And then when I realized there are these differences and there are Oriental Orthodox and or Eastern Orthodox and all this stuff, then I had to look into the history of it and uh, the Christology and all of that and i i read honestly the kind of the the deal breaker for me was reading the acts of the council of chalcedon that was like oh my gosh i'm reading this council how could this council have been right look at what's happening here there's mm -hmm. no way this is led by the holy spirit um so and then that obviously is a rabbit hole when you study history you keep looking into more and more things and everybody who knows me online knows that I'm kind of like the history guy and the Coptic brothers on with me. They tend to do the metaphysics and whatever. Um, so, yeah, that's how I ended up at the Syriac Orthodox Church. By the way, folks, we will be doing a part two, God willing. There's too much information to cover in one session. And I don't want to overwhelm all of you because we're doing it for the people to hear another side. Even if you disagree, that's fine. Just at least hear them out and see why you disagree. Lord willing, we will be doing a part two. If they're available Friday, Friday, if not, sometime next week. It's their schedule. So listen, even if you disagree, even if you disagree. I bring people whom I disagree with, and I don't flip. Now, that was an introduction. You heard he wasn't born into a Syrian Orthodox church. He was evangelical. He argued his way out of it into this church. So now 
The next person who wants to introduce and identify themselves so people can get an idea. Who are you guys? Why should we listen to you? I mean, we know Sam is handsome and he's, you know, God's gift to the church. But who the heck are you guys? No, just kidding. So. Yeah, so thank you for having me, Sam. Uh, my name is Majid and I am a Coptic Orthodox uh, reader. Uh, reader. reader. Um, I was born in the Armenian church, but raised in the Chaldean Catholic church and in uh, the Antiochian Orthodox Church. And so at the age of 10, I found out about the Coptic Orthodox Church and started attending it. And from there, I, uh, yeah, it changed my life. And at the age of 16 or 17, I started to see the differences between other churches because I had thought that all the churches believe in the same thing, uh, specifically about Christology. And people started to attack the Oriental Orthodox Church. So I started to read the fathers uh, that talked about Christology, St. Cyril, St. Severus, Maximus, and so on. And I saw how the Oriental Orthodox Church agreed with St. Cyril and all the, uh, the rest of the saints. Uh, so from there, yeah, I have been doing Christology and theology overall. So you're Armenian ethnically, so yeah, you're Armenian, but also you're Armenian and Assyrian, As Assyrian, Ashuraya. So yeah. on your mother's side, yeah. So How both of our moms, me and him, are Assyrian moms. Yeah, and my yeah. dad is Armenian. So you're both your mothers are Assyrian, and they married, they betrayed their people by marrying outside of the race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's that's strike one for both of you. But anyway, so. Your study, just people understand, when you study St. Cyril and others, mm -hmm. the ancient fathers, you're convinced that their Christology is fully <clears throat> agreed upon by the Coptic. In other words, what you find in the Coptic Church is the ancient Christology of the fathers like St. Cyril. So I want people exactly. to hear what you think. That's why you ended up embracing the Coptic Church. All right, so that yeah. was Majid. Now, I have our time. What is it? You pronounce it Majd or Majid? Majid. Medjit, all right, like Magic yes. Johnson. All right, brother. Yeah. So the next person, who's next? So we can get an introduction and we can get into the beat, heart of the matter. I can go next if that's agreeable. Um, so my name is Dioscoros. Thank you, by the way, so much, Sam, for having us on. Uh, we really appreciate it. And um, so, yeah, I'm a reader in the Coptic Orthodox Church in the United States of America. And I was a uh, Chalcedonian, specifically Roman Catholic. And then as I essentially tried to find epistemological certainty for my own position, and that's where you get into sort of the history of, you know, your papalist um, proof texts or examples in history, I eventually stumbled upon, well, hold on, the Oriental Orthodox Church and the Assyrian Church of the East are before all of these proof texts or all of these concepts being historically validated that I've used mm -hmm. in my own head. And so what's up with that? And so long story short, uh, Subdeacon Daniel has been very instrumental in our long friendship and helping me to kind of come to the realization of these truths that pertain to what the original faith of the apostles is. And eventually I couldn't help but you know, uh, find that the Oriental Orthodox Church is the only one that preserved the faith of the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus, which condemns the Diophysitic Christology of the Ecumenical Council. And so that's basically where I've arrived at. Now, remember, folks, a lot of these guys, I'm old enough to be their father. Whereas with Danny, I'm old enough to be his uncle. Everyone else is so young, I'm old enough to be I'm kin. Now, because they're young, they're passionate, they like to use these terms, but they don't explain what they mean like <clears throat> epistemological, right, and all these other terms. Remember, guys, you have people here that want to understand what you're saying. When you don't explain terms, you're going to lose them. Epistemological? What the hell is that? Or papalism? So define your terms because you want to help them understand why some of you ended up 
embracing Oriental Orthodoxy, or like this precious sister and the Lord, look what she just said. I'm lost already. So remember your audience, bring them along to understand. Mm -hmm. Epistemological, epistemi, to know truth. How do we discover truth? But define your terms so people can follow because now there's a shock. Some of them are like, wait, you were Roman Catholic and you ended up embracing Oriental Orthodoxy and rejecting Chalcedonian Christology. Even that, Chalcedonian Christology. They don't know these languages, these terms. Define your terms so they can follow with you. So that was your introduction. The next two in line. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll go next. Uh, my name is Aiken. I am a and Orthodox. And I'm a reader in the Coptic Orthodox Church. I've been raised Coptic Orthodox and I've been Coptic my entire life. I think I'm the only one uh, in this chat who is fully Coptic, fully uh, raised, uh, grown Coptic all the way. And um, I haven't, I've been studying this topic for around three years now. Uh, it's been something of a lot of interest to me, especially similar to Majd. It was, uh, it all started when I decided to, to look into the other churches and to and into other faith. Oh, is my mic too loud? No, it's your mic is very like squeaky and it's uh, hard to hear. Now, three of you said you were readers. Now, for people who have no idea what a reader is, three of you said you are readers in the Coptic Church. What is a reader in the Coptic Church? Uh, a reader is one of the ranks of the lower uh, deaconship. So. There are several several uh, ranks to be a deacon. There's a chanter, who's just someone who follows along in the liturgy and sings yeah. along. And then there's a reader, who is allowed to read the gospel during the liturgy. And then there's subdeacon, which is what Daniel and uh, Zaya are. And after that, there's full deacon, archdeacon, priest, etc. Okay. So, all right. Yeah, and if you can, we'll try to see if your mic is better quality, but we'll we'll try to work through that. So we have one final guy. Who is this final guy? Yeah, so uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm Zay. I'm a subdeacon in the Syrian Church of the East. Uh, <gasps> wait, wait. Born you are part of the Nestorian Church, you heretic? Yeah, I am part of the Nestorian Church. I was born and raised, baptized, and uh, growing up, you know, I heard the term Nestorian thrown around. I never knew what it meant, so... Long time ago, I decided to look into it and led me to look into other positions, positions of the Oriental Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox, Roman Catholic, looking at the early fathers. And, uh, you know, I came to the conclusion that the Church of the East is consistent in its Christology with the early fathers. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been a topic, like I can said, it's been a topic uh, of interest to me because of the controversy, like the Oriental Orthodox are involved in the controversy, often called monophysite. So, being in that environment, you want to look into it. You want to know how you defend these, you know, positions. Yeah, position. so that, that's why I was interested. And in. yeah. So here's what's interesting, folks. You have someone who's Syrian Orthodox. You have three Coptic Orthodox and one Assyrian Church of the East. And though they have disagreements, they all get along and can agree to disagree and have respectful conversations without assigning the other to the pit of hell. Isn't that ironic? Interesting. So with those introductions, by the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ watching over all of you, and I pray the Lord rebuke any distractions of Satan and grant everyone illumination because this is a very important topic. Let's get into the meat of the matter. What is the issue? What do you mean Chalcedonian Christology is substantially not different from the Church of the East? What is Chalcedonian Christology? What is Nestorianism? And what do you mean Church of the East? Let's define those terms for the audience because I'm learning as well. You got it. Okay. So uh, for us, um, Mejd, do you want to go over uh, Chalcedonian Christology and how it leads to the Church of the East? I mean, I can do that, but I, I think it's maybe better to start off with what Nestorianism is. Okay. Let's do it. Do it. Oh, do you want me to do that or do you want me to do the uh, Chalcedonian Christology? Oh, you want you want uh, Shamasha Shamasha Zaya? Do you want to do the Church of the East part, and Mejd will do the Chalcedon part? Go for it. Like the Church of the East, what we believe? Yeah. yeah. So what we believe is that Christ is one person, but in this one person, there are two particular natures. So 
he has a particular human nature and a particular divine nature. So uh, that that's in contrast to the Miaphysites that would say that Christ has one nature. So we would say the same thing that the Chalcedonians say, that Christ, after the union, he is in two natures. He exists within two natures, two specific natures. So you have, like for example, uh, universal humanity, and then you have Peter and Paul. So those would be particulars in humanity. So you have... Yeah. So an a particularization of said universal, which would be humanity. So Christ has a specific human flesh, which is, has its own properties distinct from our flesh. So that would be our position, that Christ exists in two specific natures. Oh. Now, before you move on, we're going to have someone explain miaphysitism, because that's a new one for a lot of people who are not familiar with what miaphysitism teaches, because as he articulated what the Church of the East believes, which is what Eastern Orthodox Catholics believe, Christ has a divine nature, human nature, but he's not two persons. Catholic and Orthodox hear that. Eastern Orthodox, okay, well, that's what we believe. But what is miaphysitism? Are you denying that Jesus is a man in heaven with a glorified body? What do you mean? Explain that to the audience. Mesh, go for it. Okay. So everyone agrees that Christ assumed the human nature. So Christ is both divine and human. The, the question is, how is Christ divine and human? So is he a divine human person? Is he a divine human being? Is he a mixture of both? What is he? And so Miaphysism stresses out that Christ is truly God and truly man. And that both of, both of these natures united in a union that cannot be explained. And that the divine nature, or as, we, as the fathers call it, the word here, and the human nature, which they say is the flesh, united and became the word, the word incarnate, the word made flesh. And so out of these two, the word and the flesh, you have the word incarnate, which is the one Lord Jesus Christ. And the, because of that, out of these two natures, a composition happens. And that's what we call the one incarnate nature, hmm. which is both divine and human. Or in more simple terms, it's the word incarnate. Yeah. Let, let me break it down for people too, because I, I think I got it. And I'm helping, not because I'm trying to speak. Believe me, I want people to get you, honestly. Please. So you understand what he's not saying. Do you see what I keep saying, people? He did not say Jesus is not human, that he's not a man, but that the divine and human natures make up one composite nature. What does he mean by composite? He doesn't mean the divine mixed into the human, the human mixed into the divine, right? So you have a deified human nature or a humanized divine nature. See what he just said? In the word who became flesh, it is a composite nature. So they speak of one nature, but this nature is composite, meaning it encompasses the divine nature and human nature. So you see, the Coptics do not deny Jesus is man with a glorified body, as I've been saying for ages. Now, did I accurately represent what you just said, brother? Yes, and if it's okay, can I just share a picture? Because I made a diagram once illustrating this. You're an this artist concept. too? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't say that at all. Let, let me just find the... Okay, let me see if I can bring it up. So that's why they mean miaphysitism, a composite nature. Composite means it's not <clears throat> a singularity. It is a composition of these divine and human natures together. All right. Can you see it? Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, right here. Okay, yeah. So out of these two, so you, you, the circles represent the natures. Uh, the green is uh, the human nature or the flesh, and the red is the divine nature or the word here. And out of these two natures, the word and the flesh, there exists one composite nature or the word incarnate and this one nature is both green and red so it's not mm. a mixture that they make up a new color or a new nature but these two circles which are of course separate when we think about them because the divinity is not humanity but because of their union they exist as one circle as one nature hmm. beautiful you see that guys you guys who want to detect and condemn the Coptics and others for holding me on physicism. Did you hear it from the source? 
Did you guys hear it? He didn't say the humanity became divine or the divine became human. No, they did not fuse into each other. They are united in the person of Christ. So they speak of a composite nature. Just like Sargon said at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, I know people say, no, no, no. So we're saying the same thing, different description of analogy. So just much and you Coptic, so people don't ever twist and slander you. You do believe Christ has a glorified physical body, right? Yes, of course. That, uh, we call it uh, theosis because that's like yes. where the first theosis happened, that Christ right. divinized his human body and soul through, through its union and, and through grace because of the resurrection. See that glorified body, what we call theosis. So he's still a man with a glorified body. And when he returns, and you guys all believe he's returning physically to the earth, right? Yes. So, what is it all about this hatred and vitriol? But anyway, thank you for explaining Mia Physitism. Mia Physitism. You. you guys heard it. Syrian church, they speak of two natures. Two natures, divine human nature. Two natures, one person. Coptics say it's a composite nature. He's divine. He's human. These natures did not fuse into each other, creating a third nature. It is a composite nature. So now that we got those terms out of the way, proceed. Uh, Shamash Isaiah, do you want to go over why the Church of the East does not accept the Council of Ephesus? And let's talk about what the Council of Ephesus is, right, Sam? Yeah, explain that. Okay, and so the year was 431 AD, by the way. The Council yeah. of Ephesus, for those who don't know, Convene in the year 431 AD. What's that council about? Why did the Assyrian Church not accept it? So I want to give a little bit of an introduction to the to the viewers on the his, the historical context of the Council of Ephesus, how it got to that point to have a council in the first place, and what a council even is. What is a church council, right? Let's let's kind of let's try to uh, talk about that so people don't uh, who don't know maybe. They can have a little bit of the background. So in, in the third century, uh, 260 to 268, there was a patriarch of Antioch. His name was Paul, Paul of Samosata. Heretic, Paul right? of Samosata, yes, heretic. He said, uh, when Christ was baptized, God the Word, the second person of the Trinity, adopted him in the baptism. Obviously, heretical, right? The yep. Synod of Antioch deposed Paul of Samosata. The Universal Church uh, recognized the deposition. This is Elijah Yassi, who I mentioned earlier, by the way. By the way, this is that Chaldean heretic, Elijah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love you, bro. What, Nina, hold on, hold on. Nina, say. Nina, he's a brother in Christ. Nina, why did you block him? I'm going to have to make him a mod. He's Chaldean. He loves the Lord. Why did you block him? Go ahead, brother. Let's stop for a So, so, uh, so then, uh, his nephew, Paul's nephew, Lucian, Lucian of Antioch, and uh, Shamash Azaya, uh, like this is, you know, this is our narrative, and and you could, you have, you're gonna have time. You could, uh, you know, if you feel free to disagree with me on any point. So, uh, Lucian of Antioch, the nephew of Paul, he was the teacher of Diodor of Tarsus. If anyone's heard of Diodor. Theodore of Tarsus, he, he opened a school called the School of Antioch, okay? And his most brilliant student, his name was Theodore of Mopsuestia. Oh, my goodness. All right. Theodore's student is who Nestorius. All right. So Nestorius becomes the bishop or patriarch of Constantinople. And when he's in Constantinople... He has a visiting bishop there from the same school. And uh, the bishop goes, um, don't call Mary Theotokos, call her Christokos. It's more accurate um, because it's including both of the natures, uh, human and, to, and divine. And uh, Nestorius didn't stop him. He just left it like that. The people in Constantinople complained to Cyril of Alexandria Pope of Alexandria at the time. Um, and because Alexandria had primacy in the East. So Cyril writes to Nestorius, he goes, they told me this, but I don't believe them. You don't, you don't do something like that. And Nestorius answers him. Again, Shamash Azaya, you can feel free to disagree with me anytime. Nestorius answers him in my when I'm reading the, the correspondence. He answers him in a, 
not a friendly way, that's to say, to say the least. Cyril answers again. He tells him, what do you mean? This is not what we received. We received this and this and this. And again, Nestorius replies, essentially, who in the blue color are you telling me? Cyril then writes to him a third letter. And in the third letter, he lays the smack down. And he tells him the call of anathemas. And he tells him, um, uh, the word of God was truly crucified for us in the flesh, and he will come back to judge you. He tells him that. And then the the two patriarchs and the different seas, so the story is at Constantinople, Cyril and Alexandria, they start to write to the other bishops in the in the Roman world. And Cyril, they both write to the Bishop of Rome, Celestine, the Pope of Rome at the time. Cyril's smart enough to have his letters translated into Latin before sending them. Nestorius doesn't do that. He sends them into Greek and then just waits for them to translate it for him. Mm. So then the Pope of Rome reads the Latin first because it's available. And he's like, okay, Nestorius, you have two weeks to recant of, of this. This is not what we received. Who is friends with Nestorius? The emperor, Emperor Theodosius. Emperor Theodosius, he likes Nestorius. They're friends. He's like, no, no, forget about what the Pope said. We're going to do a council. Who's presiding at the council, though? Theodore of Alexandria presides. And, mm -hmm. and he's also representing two seas. He's representing Rome and Alexandria mm -hmm. at the council of Ephesus. So they get to Ephesus. Nestorius is there. Um. John of Antioch, who was Nestorius's peer and friend, the Patriarch of Antioch at the time, is coming to the council, but he's late. So he tells Cyril, he's like, wait a week for me. If I don't get there, go ahead and start. A week passes. John isn't there yet. The other bishops are like, it's okay. Keep waiting for him. Cyril's like, no, nah, I'm good. He starts the council. June 22nd, my birthday. June 22nd, he starts the council. And right away, Nestorius, obviously, he's not showing up because his friends aren't there. He doesn't have his sight. N uh, Cyril excommunicates Nestorius on the spot. He excommunicates uh, uh, anybody who doesn't admit to the 12 anathemas, Cyril. And so, uh, so Nestorius', uh, Nestorius friends eventually get there. They're pissed because Cyril started the council already without them being there. So then they have an, another council of Ephesus in the same time, Nestorius's friends have their own council of Ephesus that condemns the emperor. The emperor now is confused. He accepts both councils. And then eventually Cyril gets to keep his spot over complications and, and Nestorius is exiled. And the whole issue was one nature versus two natures. That's the whole issue. This, what you're seeing in front of you, viewers, us, me being Syrian Orthodox, the three Coptic brothers, and then Shema Shazaya of the Church of the East. This, this, we are the fruit of this issue. We who believe in Cyril and what Cyril said about one nature versus two natures like Shema Shazaya believes. So Cyril and Nestorius, here is what Ephesus said. Ephesus was saying, one nature after the union, you cannot say two natures. Shema Shazaya, can you tell us why the Church of the East cannot accept the Council of Ephesus 431? Now, before you move on, <clears throat> you mentioned a few Cyrils. Yeah. The one in the 5th century who was presiding in the Council representing the Pope, is that Cyril of Alexandria? Yes, sir. Because you said he affirmed one nature. That's correct. Cyril of Alexandria did? I thought it was Cyril of Jerusalem. So he affirmed one nature, huh? They, they both do. Wow. Yeah. So Cyril of Alexandria, who's a saint in the Orthodox Church, am I correct? Eastern Orthodox? Right. Correct. Yeah. He That's believed not... in one nature? Yeah, absolutely. After the union? Uh-huh. He condemns saying two natures after the union. You can't say it for Cyril. And the Council of Ephesus itself anathematizes saying two natures after the union. So how is he a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church? But go ahead. You guys, you guys are baffling me more and more, but go ahead. Uh, so St. Severus, he gives the challenge. He says, show me show me a church father who says uh, two natures after the union. Who says it? Show me who. Because there isn't, Sam. There isn't the, Chalcedo the, the Cappadocian fathers, the, the saints, St. Saint Gregory, uh, St. Basil, and the, the Alexandrian fathers, Cyril and Athanasius, 
Who says two natures after the same? The Asurai fathers, Mar Apram, Afra. Who says two natures after the union? Nobody says it. So up until we get to the fifth century, the fathers are consistent in articulating one composite nature after an incarnation, huh? Absolutely. Seth, look, notice what the, the Chalcedonians, when they're arguing against Church of the East, which fathers do they use? Do they use their post schism fathers or pre schism fathers with, that they have with us? They use our fathers. They use our pre schism to talk to the church because they can't use their post schism because their post schism guys agree with that. It comes afterwards. Yeah. So the other day we did a review uh, on, a, on a video reviewing Marmari from an Eastern Orthodox who's criticizing Marmari. And I said, I said, uh, the guy, the guy in the video, he's he's using Saint Severus's argument. Saint Severus, who they anathematize, he's a saint for us. He's using Saint Severus's argument against the Church of the East. Well, this is our guy. It's not your guy. How are you? And then, ironically, the guy says, "So Christ has one nature after the union." The EO guy is saying it hmm. because against the Church of the East, they don't have an argument. So let so the audience can understand. So we don't. Get confused, and guys, I'm doing. I'm learning with you guys. Believe me, this is new stuff for me. The Eastern Fathers, especially the Syriac Fathers, because we're Syriac, you and I, Aturaya, Ashuraya, we speak Syriac. Yeah. The Eastern Fathers, the Syriac Fathers, up until the fifth century, spoke of one composite nature after the union. Did not speak of two natures, because someone said, "Well, there were some Latin fathers." Yeah, but if you notice what he said. He's talking about the Eastern fathers, the Syriac-speaking fathers in the East. So are we understanding this correctly? Absolutely, Sam. And I know Shamash Shazaya is going to have a different opinion on this. So that's why I'll bring him in. I yeah. just want to be clear because this is a shock. Because if the Eastern Orthodox affirms the two natures, Chalcedon, and you're telling me St. Cyril of Alexander did not, how is he one of their saints? Because they are... They are mistranslating um, him, misinterpreting him. There's nowhere ever where Cyril says two natures after the union. There's not That's a the big question. Him. Like, like it, it's inconsistent to, to like both accept him and then like deny his teachings about one incarnate nature. Wow. Okay, guys, um, thank you because you're helping me. I'm I'm learning. I have a quote from Mar Ephraim. He says. Mar Apram, for whoever doesn't know, he's one of our. He's the big. He we call him Shimshit Surai. He's the he's the son, the son of this of this. Of the Syrians, Ashurai, sons of Ashur. Yep. Yeah. So he's one. He's our biggest saint of our people, I would say. Um, and the the quote is. He mingled. Listen to this, Sam. He mingled the natures like pigments. And an image came into being, the God Man. This is Mar Apram saying it. Imagine if we said that. I was like, oh, monophysites, monophysites. They're condemned heretics, yeah. Yeah, but Apram says it. Everyone has Apram canonized. There was going to say anything. Everybody has him canonized. Everyone Anybody? canonized him? Yeah. Wow. It's more complicated than I thought. Okay. All right. Good. I'm learning. So. If you, you want Shamash Azay to share his view, I'd like to hear it because the Assyrians. Yeah. Now, yeah. guys, Assyrians actually are in agreement with the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic when they speak of two natures. Mm -hmm. And yet the Assyrians are still condemned by the Eastern Orthodox. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. I'm sorry, man. Go ahead, man. I, talk to me, Aziza. Yeah, so obviously I'm going to disagree with uh, uh, Shamash Azay on what he was saying about. Assyrians disagree? No. Good. Yeah, about the history leading up and, you know, the quote from Ephraim, obviously, I can give a different uh, interpretation to the quote. But besides the point, to touch on what he said, why we reject Ephesus, it's just as he said it. It's because the Christology that Ephesus brings forth is not the Christology that is consistent with the uh, father's prior, which would be a one nature Christology, which we can never accept. So Cyril has multiple quotes uh, where he says not to speak of two natures after the union that after the union, it's one nature from two natures. And he has all type, and he says that, you know, the distinction, the distinction uh, is uh, done away with, like, into two. So those types of statements is where we would disagree with Ephesus. So a lot of people think that we disagree so with Ephesus because of its condemnation of Nestorius. Well, no, because if you look at St. Baba the Great, he um, 
he really like respects Leo. He calls Leo a saint because of his Christology. So historically, the Church of the East did accept of Leo, that did accept Leo's Christology, but went against uh, Ephesus Christology because of its one nature formulations. And if you look at the Church of the East fathers historically, like Baba the Great, he always links Cyril with the Oriental Orthodox post schism saints like Severus of Antioch and Philoxenos and all these people. So when you're looking at Church of the East saints, they're never connecting Cyril with Chalcedonians. Right? They, they think that Chalcedonianism and what Cyril had are completely two different faiths. And that's even in the Marganita where he lists yes. the yes. Cyrillians yes. and then the Melkites and then our position. So when you're looking at Before Ephesus... You on. And, Hold on. Before you go, yeah. so that people can follow you. You are saying that the Assyrian Church recognizes that prior to Ephesus, there were fathers in the East that affirmed one composite nature. No, I'm saying, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that in regards to Ephesus, the true successors of Ephesus would be the Oriental Orthodox as we know it today. So the Syriac, the true adherers of the Council of Ephesus would be the Miaphysites because that's what Cyril taught. He says, after the union, there's one nature. Um, and you can't even say two. You no, don't even speak of two. That's what he says. So such statements, we believe, are not consistent with, but obviously we're going to disagree on that point. But what we do agree upon is that Ephesus, in essence, is an anti diophysite council. It, it goes against diophysitism completely oh, and anathematizes all forms of di diophysitism. Wow. So for that reason, it, hmm. you see that saints like Babai, um and other poets always link Cyril and Severus together or Cyril and Dioscoros together uh, because we believe that Ephesus is Miaphysite. So that's why we can't accept it because we believe there's two natures. Ephesus teaches against that. So that's the reason why we reject it. Bombshell. You guys just throw a bombshell on me. Sorry, guys, if I interject because I'm learning. Okay. Please. Now, here's the bombshell. You guys hear what he just admitted, Council of Ephesus, which from what I understand, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox accept. Now understand what you just heard, and they got it all documented. They're not going to lie because they know they have enemies who are going to bash them. The Assyrian Church is more consistent in this regard with, than the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic, from what I understand. The Assyrian Church will not accept the Council of Ephesus because it affirms one composite nature, which the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic reject, but they accept the Council of Ephesus. Am I getting this right? Correct, Sam. Yeah, you're 100% correct. Damn, Cyril, you, says, this is Cyril says in his one of his dialogues to not even speak of two. Don't even speak about it. Woo! And so that's Shut the thing. Like that. That's why, like I said, saints like Baba the Great would always connect these two uh, traditions together. So we acknowledge yeah. that, that the true successors of Ephesus are the Oriental Orth is the Oriental Orthodox communion, just as they would say, that the consistent diaphysites are the Church of the East because we don't have the baggage that comes with accepting Ephesus. Wow. It is beautiful to hear that as much as the Assyrian Church has been bashed by some Eastern Orthodox, it turns out they're more consistent with diaphysitism. Do you understand what you're hearing, Ortho Eastern Orthodox? The Assyrian Church has been more consistent in affirming the two natures because they rejected a council Council of Ephesus, which affirm a composite nature, which the Eastern Orthodox reject. The Assyrians rejected the council for that reason, and yet they're the ones who are being bashed when they're being more consistent with the view that Christ has two natures after the union. And I also want to say, um, when you read the Our Fathers, and we have like we, ha we have disagreements about leading up to uh, Ephesus, like where he quoted Ephraim, I would disagree on what Ephraim says, but this is the, you know, Sim the simple agreement is that we recognize Ephesus as near yeah, yeah. And apart from that, Chalcedon contradicts that. So that would be the positions that we're trying to defend today. Okay. Okay. Wow, something new. Council of Ephesus is rejected because it's a Mia Hussite council. And, so and, Sam, yeah. and if, if, if you want to like see the sources, we have them. Oh, yeah. so, Can you document for those who are going to bash you and say you're lying because you want to document it? Yeah, we have. Like, we like, have so. a big presentation. Um, if you'd like, I can present it. Yes, I mean, my friend, we're going to do multiple parts. So what I told Subdeacon, we'll try to teach each part within two hours. But you're going to come back if you want. To. I want you to come back and finish it. I want you to give a comprehensive case because then 
Guy wants to come back in February and present a case why he doesn't accept what you have to say. So I want you to make a comprehensive case. Leave no stone unturned. So take your time. We're going to yeah. do two hours today. So we got another hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. And then Lord willing, bring you back for part two. Beautiful. Thank you. Let me let me uh, let me continue in the story a little bit to take. Yes, us. they want you to finish the story. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so in four thirty one, after the Council of Ephesus, there was an excommunication. On one side, you have Rome and Ephesus. Uh, sorry, you're Rome and Alexandria. On the other side, you have Antioch and Constantinople, and there was an excommunication for two years between the two sides, and then there was the formula of reunion drawn up by Theodora, sent by John of Antioch, yeah. and signed so so by Cyril. In a Miaphysite interpretation, this is the key, that for Cyril to accept the formula of reunion, you have to accept the Council of Ephesus and the 12 anathemas. The 12 anathemas are non-negotiable, equal to the Creed of Nicaea. You can't get away from that. The way the Antiochians accepted uh, the formula of reunion was that the formula of reunion simply replaces the 12 anathemas and the Council of Ephesus, and we don't need to worry about them anymore. So even the reunion was done in a way that was not understanding of each other. And the evidence of this, you have uh, Ibas's letter, the letter of Ibas. Ibas was the bishop of Edessa. So he came from the same school, okay? Now, the, he said, Cyril repented of his 12 anathemas. This is what Ibas says in his letter to the Church of the East, to modern, to modern Church, Church, Church of the East Patriarch. He writes to him, he tells him, Cyril repented of his 12 anathemas. Okay? This letter, by the way, was accepted at the Council of Chalcedon. I'm going to say that a few more times mm -hmm. in the show. All right. Now, uh, 448... Let's fast forward a little bit. 448, there's a synod in Constantinople with a guy, a monk, a heretical monk, his name was Eurykes, who didn't know anything. As we say, he didn't know his head from his feet. He didn't know anything. And they asked him, they said, uh, is, God, is Jesus consubstantial with his father and consubstantial with his mother? He said, I don't know what consubstantial means. Uh, he said, whatever Athanasius said, I say it. I don't know what, what uh, consubstantial means. He should have kept his mouth shut. He shouldn't even talk, this guy. So, uh, and then they tried to impose on him to say, because they're from the same school, remember Constantinople, they're from the same school, say, say in two natures, Christ is in two natures, and I can't say that. This is not what my father's taught me. So yeah, I don't know a lot of things, but I can't say this. So then they excommunicate him. Who's his friend? The same emperor, who was Nestorius' friend, Theodosius, still alive. He's like, oh, I don't want this guy to be excommunicated. The successor of Cyril in Alexandria, handpicked successor, St. Dioscoros of Alexandria, is now the Pope of Alexandria. So the, the, the emperor Theodosius says, come, Dioscoros, preside over another council in Ephesus so you can exonerate this guy, Eutyches. So in 449, Dioscoros presides over the council. He exonerates Eutyches because Eutyches gives an orthodox confession of faith. Now, the people who tried Eutyches for heresy, because Eutyches was found orthodox at the time, they have to be tried for heresy. Hmm. So they tried Flavian of Constantinople, the rest of them, Eusebius, whatever. They're tried, and you guys believe in two natures after the union? And uh, they don't answer. They don't give a defense for themselves. The Oscoros deposes, the, the Council of Ephesus too deposes them. By the way, called by the same emperor, Theodosius, who called the first Council of Ephesus, this emperor is canonized by all the churches, except for the church of Greece. Now, so he's he's deposed, uh, he's deposed, uh, Flavian is deposed, but who else is deposed? The entire Antiochian school of Theodore and Theodore and Nestorius and Theodore, the entire school is excommunicated. There's no more compromising, no more formula of reunion. Ibas is excommunicated, all that stuff. No more, we're not going to, we're not going to tolerate this kind of talk anymore. It's over. But what happens at the council? Leo, because he sent his legates, the Pope of Rome at the time, Leo, he sent his representatives to the council with a letter. The letter, they call it the Tome of Leo. Hmm. It, in this letter, it is the judgment of Eutyches. But why would you read the judgment before the trial happens? 
That's what the council is for. The council is the trial. So why would you read the, the, the judgment if the trial didn't happen yet? So then after the, the judgment, after the guy gave an orthodox confession of faith, there was no more reason to read the Tome of Leo because the judgment is obsolete, right? Now, the Tome of Leo is diaphysical. And Leo learned from his teacher, Augustine, and there is connection between Augustine and the of Celestia. Now, so Leo's letter, like uh, Shamash Isaiah just said, Leo's, Leo is revered in the Church of the East for his diaphysitism. Now, with that counsel and having the ability to excommunicate Leo, because it's an imperially called council, and their decision was imperially recognized as law of the land, they still did not excommunicate Leo, and they didn't condemn him. That hmm. tells you something. That they could have, and they didn't. Now, Leo, though, is upset because they didn't read his letter. He excommunicated them all. <laughs> so now you have a big schism between the West and the East because Leo was mad they didn't read his letter. He excommunicated them. And then the, uh, the emperor dies. A new emperor comes in. He's like, Leo, I want to reconcile you. I want to reconcile Italy. What can I do? He's like, well, make the tome. It's not negotiable. Make, it, make everybody accept it. He's like, okay, I'm going to call a new council. You, can, you guys can have your way, whatever you want to do in the council. The council happens. Leo obviously reverses in his mind, reverses everything that happened at Ephesus 2. So Theodoret comes back. All these guys come back in into, into their spots. Chalcedon happens. Dioscoros is deposed. Leo gets his way in everything. Now, Theodoret, we ask the other side, we tell them, Theodoret was the friend of Nestorius. And he wrote against Cyril. Why did you guys accept him? They tell us he repented. Where is, where is his repentance? I want to see. They tell me the Acts of Chalcedon, where he says, I have always been Orthodox and my teachers were Orthodox. That's his repentance. Is his repentance? <laughs> where is his repentance? So Theodoret, Theodoret Sam, he, he has a line. It's a very famous line. He says it in his writings against Cyril. Look what he says. He says, it is not the one who has life in himself who is killed. Rather, it is the one who possesses a mortal nature. Everyone hear that? It is not the one who has life in himself who is killed. Rather, it is the one who possesses a mortal nature. Now, I'm going to read, after reading this, I'm going to read what seems like a response to this, but actually... <laughs> The quotes I'm about to read were written over a hundred years before this. And it's as if they're responding to him by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Look, so the first one being from St. Afraha, who is one of our Syriac saints. He says, the living one died instead of the dead. And through his death made our deadness come alive. This is St. Afrahat, second demonstration. So he's responding to Theodore, who was much later. And then Ephraim, who I mentioned earlier, look what Ephraim says. Ephraim says, today there is born to you the life giver. The angel did not say there is born a man who will be a life giver or who will be a Messiah, but rather today there is born to you the life giver. Savior. Who is not who is to become, but who is the Lord. And, yeah. and finally, and this is from the Church of the East. I'm going to read to you something. From the Church of the East, before the schism, because they are Khinwati. So Brothers. before the schism uh, in, the, in the Ninwe area, this was written. What is Nineveh today? So the capital of our people at the time. Uh, look at what they wrote. This is in the 4th century, okay? Ktha'wad Maskhatha, the name of the source. Okay. Moreover, the word greatly excited creation. Who? The word. The word greatly excited creation. And it was turned around because they heard that the Son of God had died on account of sinners in order that they might repent and live. All the worlds were stirred. He who gives life to all 
died on account of his creatures. The Gentiles heard the care of God for them. And when people heard that a son of Adam died for his companions, it is one thing to hear that the son of Adam died for his companions, but another thing when they hear that the son of God died for his creation. Huh? Not the son of Adam, son of God died for his creation. Mine, yeah. Okay. And for his servants, it is not extraordinary that the sons of Adam die on account of their colleagues, since their nature is imperfect. But as the Lord, whose nature transcends death, died for the evil sons of Adam. Hmm. Human beings were captivated by this love because of this and loved him. But for the sake of the whole world which was lost, our Lord appeared physically so that he might win the whole world and so that the whole world might know the will of the God of God from God himself and from his footsteps. Therefore, his advent was for the sake of everyone so that everyone might learn of his lowliness, his kindness, and his gentleness so that people should not excuse themselves from this love and lowliness and patient suffering because they see that the Lord of all endured everything before them for the sake of everyone in view of all so that they marvel and say, if our Lord endured everything for our iniquity, how much more necessary it is for us. Than for us. Okay, so this is the Christology that we have. Ephesus has nothing to do with us having this Christology. Ephesus affirms the Christology that we had before it. The, the, the creed of the Synod of Antioch, before Nicaea, we were saying, Yeldath Alaha, before, before Ephesus, I'm saying before Nicaea, yeah. Ephesus is 431, before Nicaea, before 325, in the creed of the Church of Antioch, we are saying Yeldath Alaha. I mean, the birth of God, so they know what the Yeldath Alaha oh, means. The mother of God. The oh, mother of God. Yeah, Yelda. The mother of God, we're saying it before Nicaea, we're saying it in our creed. We're saying this about this single subject incarnate, one incarnate nature who dies on the cross for his creation. We're saying it before all of these councils. The council doesn't innovate. The council affirms. This is what it received. Anything innovates, we reject it. That's why we reject Chalcedon, because it's an innovation. Hmm. So the councils of Ephesus 1 and 2 are Miophysite councils. And you have... The Eastern Christians, we'll say Assyrian, Syriac speaking, mm -hmm. all affirming composite nature. So the quotes you gave so people understand, what he was trying to show you, they didn't say the man Christ died, the son of Adam died. They say the Lord died, God died. He contrasts it, Sam. He says it's one thing for a son of Adam to die, yes. but it's another thing that the Lord of all whose nature transcends death dies for his creation so god died now obviously he well, died a human death but you understand what he's trying to show you that the language of these christians in the east they didn't so distinguish the humanity of christ from his divinity they spoke of god dying the son of god dying the lord dying not just merely a son of adam so they would speak of god dying the lord almighty dying just like in first corinthians 2 verse 8 where it says they crucified the Lord of glory. Beautiful. First Corinthians 2, verse 8. They crucified the Lord of glory. That's the title referring to his deity. Or in Acts 20, 28, where it says, Shepherd the church of God, which he, God, purchased by his own blood. God purchased the church by his blood. God has blood. The Lord of glory crucified. So they're following the language of Scripture and affirming that it was God who died, and they didn't so distinguish the natures as to speak. Well, Christ as man died. That's what he's trying to show you. This was the language. All the way up until the Council of Chalcedon. All right. Well, interesting. And, and, and I want to say this last point about this. Um, so, Shamasha Zeya by Nukhraba, you know that. Uh, okay. Um, so, I, I just want to say, and I've talked to Shamasha about this before many times, but it's uh, just so I can drive the point home. Uh, Hebrews, uh, St. Paul, he wrote the book of Hebrews, and he's writing to the Hebrews. He's not going to write to the Hebrews in Greek. He's going to write to the Hebrews in Aramaic in my language. This is why Western Christianity does not know who wrote Hebrews. 
because yeah. they assume he wrote it in Greek, but he didn't. It was translated into Greek by either Luke or Clement or Barnabas, or one of his students. But Paul wrote it in our tongue for our people and for the Jews who were speaking Aramaic. Now, when he wrote it in Aramaic, the Aramaic original, according to Dr. Sebastian Brock, he has an article about this. It's called Tell, the tell people who Sebastian Brock is. Sebastian Brock is right now the foremost Syriac scholar in the world. And by the way, he is uh, officially a Melpana now in the Syriac Orthodox Church. He was Anglican for all his life. So now he can... he's in, yeah, in his 90s, he became Syriac Orthodox. Let me explain what you just said. Brethren, Sebastian Brock, you can't underestimate this man. Even William Albrecht has interviewed him. He is the foremost scholar on Syriac Christology. He has written articles, tomes, showing why the Syrian Church of the East is not what you would call, you know, the typical historian that there's a divine person, a human person, but be that as may, his research has led him to become what now? He was Anglican, he's now what? Syrian Orthodox. Syrian Orthodox. His research of church history led him to convert to the Syrian Orthodox Church. So there you go. Now go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Okay. So uh, in his article, he writes about the discrepancy in the Syriac version of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, two, especially verse 2, as uh, chapter 2, verse 9, the, the second, 2.9b. Okay. So in 2.9b, um, there is a difference between the Syrian Orthodox rendering and the Church of the East rendering. Now, the church, the Syrian Orthodox, we say, hmm. So, for the sake of everyone, God tasted death. That's okay. so wow. Now, in the in the East Syriac, in the Church of the East, oh. it says. Exactly. Wow, what an interesting variant. Wow. Apart from God, he tasted it. So this is a big difference. It is. Okay, so Dr. Brock, he writes his article and he concludes. And you know, Sam, just like you said, Dr. Brock, he loves the Etid Medancha. He loves the Church of the East. He's he defended it, yeah. Absolutely. He doesn't have a horse in the race and the time he's writing the article, especially. So when he's writing it, he says, well, how can we find out the original version of this? Well, let's see what the Surai, Abu Athan Surai, what did they say? What did what commentary did they have? Which verse do we find in their writings? Which version of the verse existed back then? Mar Apram, in his commentary on Hebrews 2 9, which one does he have? He has the Syrian Orthodox one. He doesn't have the Church of the East one. How get a play booth? So then Ephraim confirms the original form of the verse to be the Syrian Orthodox form. So the, why the corruption in the Church of the East one is not because of the Wathi Surai. It's not because of the Assyrians. It's because of the Greeks that we allowed into our people. Now, just so people understand what you're saying, because I followed this. When you said it, I understood where you're going with this. Yeah. There's a variant reading found in the translation of Hebrews 2, verse 9. So you understand what he's referring to. He's saying if you go with the Greek, the majority of the copies of the Greek will read that by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone. That's the majority of the copies of the Greek, Hebrews 2, 9. By the grace of God, he tasted death for everyone. There is a variant in the Greek manuscript tradition. I think there's only, from what I recall, Bar Derman mentioned only one, where it says, apart from God, he tasted death for everyone. He's saying that the Syrian churches believe that Hebrews is originally written in Syriac or Aramaic. In Aramaic, there are also two readings. The older one, and what does the older one say then and translate? Uh, how get a play booth by his grace, Allah God, for the sake of everyone, tasted death. God tasted death on behalf of everyone. That's the older reading in Syriac. Did you hear it? The older reading in Syriac is that by grace, God tasted death for everyone, so that Jesus is God who tasted death for everyone. Later on, what you're saying is the reading adopted by the Church of the East is what. 
Starman alaha. Apart from God, he tasted death on behalf of Abu. All right. So he was talking to she uh, Sheikh Shamashazai about that difference. Now, and feel free to chime in, Zai. I don't want you to just because they're not attacking each other. They're actually friends and colleagues. They work together. But he is bringing out the difference, and he's saying the reason why the Church of the East went this route is because they included non-Assyrian individuals and canonized them as saints. One of whom was Nestorius, who wasn't Assyrian. And we're going to talk about Theodore of Mopsustia, another non-Assyrian who the Church of the East canonizes as a saint. So if you want to say something, brother, go ahead. Yeah, so Sebastian Brock did analyze like 31 different manuscripts from the 5th to the 13th century. And I, I disagree a lot of uh, with what Daniel said, but even if the verse is for he and his grace God for the sake of everyone taste of death the fathers of the church of the church of the east wouldn't have a problem with that because you see post schism church of the east documents saying that the cross um is the cross of god the word right so we have no problem with that the reason that we have these statements where it's making a strict dis, dis, like distinction between the two is because of the audience right so we're arguing against there being one nature so we're going to prevent there from being any misunderstanding that God in his own nature died. So there's going to be that distinction. But you see even Theodore of Mopsuestia in On the Incarnation, where he's saying that Mary is the mother of God. He also says under that, that God did die, but not by nature, by relation. So those statements can all be understood in a way that complements the Church of the East theology. But I do acknowledge that Ephraim did read it for the grace of God. Uh, he tasted death, but... Let me... Let me solidify what you're saying so people don't misunderstand. He's saying the Church of the East, when they speak of Christ dying in his humanity, it's not because they're denying he's God, but they just want to make sure people don't get confused and say, wait, how can God die? God is ever living. Now, I understand yeah, yeah. the sensitivity of that because debating Muslims, they throw that in my face all the time. And Joe's Witnesses throw that in my face all the time. Wait, your God died? Your God died? How can God die? So what he's saying is, Church of the East agree, Jesus is truly God, truly God that died, but the death he experienced was a human death because God is ever living, living and cannot cease to exist. So I just want to make sure they're understanding what you're saying. Yeah, That's why it's, you would make the distinction. That's why yeah, the, because of the you, but yeah. even the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic would make that distinction as well. So just want you to see that you see they're not saying he's not God. He is God, but to make sure that people don't think we're saying that God as God, God as divine, ceased to be. No, God died, but the death he died was a human death. So am I yeah, representing your position correctly? Yeah, I just want to read uh, something. This is from the Khudra, which is one of the most important documents in the Church of the East. What does uh, Khudra mean? First, it means cycle. It's, uh, it's a book compilation of it's a liturgical formulary for the whole year. There's three different volumes. So on the first Sunday of Annunciation, there's a prayer that says, and this is post schism God the Word from the Father did not take the likeness of a servant from angels, but from the seed of Abraham. And in our humanity, He did come in His grace that He saved our race from error. So it's God the Word, He's the subject that came in our humanity to save our race from error. The reason that we have anti Theopaschi statements at times is because our historical position was that they're mingling the two natures and making it so that God died in His own nature. So it's kind of it's a preventative thing from that position that God died in his own nature to spread. So there was an adjustment of language. But historically, the, there are Theopaschite texts, even post-schism in the Church of the East, like I just read now. Oh, so again, use another technical term. I love you guys. Theopaschite means that God suffered the passion. Yeah, God suffered, yeah. yeah. I love you guys. I know you're young. You want to sound intelligent. Look, see, I'm smart. I can say papalism or Theo. For us bald, illiterate buffoons, Make it clear to us. Now, just when the Ortho Christos, this is your home. This is your channel, brother. Never recede in the background. You know, I love you. All right. Now, brethren, what's next? This is just part one. What's next? So I want I want them to get into if the Church of the East Christology uh, reconciles with Chalcedon. I want Shamash Isaiah to talk about this. He said he'll be back in five minutes. He has to step away because okay. I think, you know, it is when you're live, it's in the meantime, too much fluid, you know? Sure. All right. 
uh so dioscoros you wanted to do you wanted to do some slides right you wanted to show something sure um so, and since this is only the first part today yes um i'm gonna have to upload it the presentation Just and by the way guys as sooner you come back the better like i said i'm open friday because we don't want to make this too long and people then interest that because you got people hooked on what you're saying they're shocked to hear some of these things yeah. And perhaps it would be perhaps it would be profitable for the listener to listen to what the words of the fathers of the Council of Ephesus, what yes. these words are inside of the council itself and also surrounding the events of the council. Now, before you move on, brother, could you make if someone wanted to contact you guys, are these like slides that you're willing to give to people or send them by email? Sure. No problem. Um, just if you go to the Lions Den YouTube channel. And you go to say like one of our videos or one of our live streams, something like this. Uh, usually, I think Subdeacon Daniel will post the Discord right. server link, and you can kind of contact us through this way. So the um, handle the handle is just my name at Daniel Kakish, and the name of the channel is Lions. Yeah, I should have linked to your channel. I'm sorry, I'll do that afterwards because I'm okay. kind of no problem, no problem. No yeah. problem. So this is our uh, presentation, humble presentation. A few people worked on it, and um, we're happy to present it to you. I want to share quickly the outline, just very briefly. It, I don't think we'll go through all of it today by any means. Sorry, let me hit button to go to the next slide. Maybe I need to, okay, there we go. I'm, I'm, I guess I gotta do it for you. As I say, I gotta do it, but go ahead. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so the this is a three part presentation, the first part. We go into the writings surrounding the Council of Ephesus itself, namely in the three sainted bishops who presided in it. Many people know about St. Cyril of Alexandria, but they probably don't know about St. Akakius of Melitene and St. Theodotus of Ancyra. They were personal friends of Nestorius, mm. who after Nestorius became controversial because of his teaching, they and this is testified to in the minutes of uh, Ephesus itself. They basically rebuked him, but people don't realize how intensely Christological in precision their writings are, just like St. Cyril of Alexandria, despite their corpora being very small. Uh, they're very important, and we'll go over how they're very important. Part two is basically the Cappadocian era fathers. Now, let me just actually, sorry, finish with, Part one, um, we go over the Council of Ephesus and what this says about the Assyrian Church of the East and the Oriental Orthodox, one rejecting it, one accepting it. Why? Sorry? No one said anything. It was an so, echo. Nobody said anything. Oh, okay. Um, and so, yeah, that, so basically the reason is because Ephesus is a fundamentally anti-diophysite council and so in our view oriental orthodoxy we cannot at the same time accept ephesus and then accept that which ephesus anathematizes or else we would be condemning ourselves out of our own mouth mm -hmm. that's how we view it and the assyrian church of the east i'm sure they would agree that that's a an accurate assessment hence they don't hold to it so part two goes into the cappadocian era fathers in their own thinking and so this is important because the council of ephesus the fathers of that council especially saint cyril and saint theodotus of Ancyra, saint theodotus only implicitly because he doesn't have a big corpus but he'll use paraphrases of the cappadocians um they they base their anti-diophysite christology off of the cappadocians and part two basically explores into whether or not Ephesus really is a legitimate continuation of the Cappadocian era fathers. And then it part two kind of ends in a twist because we conclude that just as um, basically any diophysite, Chalcedonian, Assyrian Church of the East, you name it, would be rejected by the teaching of the Cappadocian era fathers, that the Assyrian Church of the East is actually less Nestorianizing than the mainstream Chalcedonians post the Third Council of Constantinople. 
because say, say what wait, wait 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 what did you just say you're gonna have to hammer that you're saying the assyrian church that's condemned as nestorians yes it's less of nestorians than those yep. like the eastern orthodox and roman catholic now can you make prove that assertion go ahead i want people 100 percent. and so the what we're going to uh seek to prove in that part in the second part is that the assyrian church of the east even if it's only a um a profession without substance but at least the profession that christ has one united will one united power very important and one united operation this used to be accepted by the chalcedonians during the era of the second council of constantinople but in the third council of constantinople they anathematized this position because of various factors to i guess water it down mm -hmm. um and then part three actually compares your classical theodorian assyrian church of the east christology theodore of mopsuestia oh. with the voices of those such as leo maximus and damascene and what they think about the hypostasis of christ they would claim one hypostasis but we go into is this actually even inconsistent with what they find hypostasis to be and what they say about the hypostasis of christ um so those are, that's a brief summary of the three parts and at the very end of the presentation after the third part we have an appendix with a bunch of quotes because we didn't want to cram everything um so basically if there's curiosity we can at least reference them good Good. That's why we say multiple um, things, brethren. Don't feel pressed. Uh, uh, You're with me. Don't feel pressed. Uh, would you be able to move to the third slide? Yes, uh, you would have to do it. But before you move on, don't feel pressed for time. The slower and the more parts, the better, because if you just jam it all in one session, we're going to get confused. But this is going to shock people. But people get shocked when he's coming up that from their perspective, the Eastern Orthodox, their own Catholic, are more Nestorians than the Assyrian Church because of things they said. And the terminology used, oh boy, that's going to be rough. Is this part of the slide three? So, correct. And uh, thank you for the page turn. So, um, part one here begins. We start with the first homily of St. Theodotus of Ancyra in the Council of Ephesus. St. Theodotus authored at least, well, yes, at least three homilies that are part of the acts of the council of ephesus now you won't see the published english version uh included in its translation the homilies you won't see them uh dr richard price's version translate a lot of the stuff that's part of the council of ephesus that's actually found in the codexes um you do see in his bibliography if you go to that um, that he cites Frankel's Studia Patristica entry called something like the homilies of Theodotus of Ancyra at the Council of Ephesus, something like this. And uh, this is well worth your money if you would like to read all about this. Um, but I also recommend you join our Discord server <laughs> for, related to that. Um, if you if you aren't looking to to put a lot of money out of your wallet, so we see in the opening here Saint Theodotus of Ancyra, he speaks about what unity of two constituents or elements or parts, whatever you want to call it, all of our traditions call them the natures which united, um, the traditions of the. Assyrian Church of the East and the Oriental Orthodox also speak of two hypostases uniting into one hypostasis. But what the point is, is that whatever you call these constituents, parts, elements, he says that the union of two of them does this, and he speaks about how it unites them so thoroughly so as to be a single one mm. and by itself, as you see near the top of the quote. And... Uh, he, but it's not just a word. A single one isn't just a word. 
it has a meaning, and that meaning is the abolishment of duality of the constituents according to the category of the constituents. Whether you call it nature, hypostasis, and we will get into what all of this means. He says that what has been united is no longer named two, but one. Mm. Well, what does the no longer signify? It yeah. signifies yeah. that our perception of the those natures in isolation from each other. Okay, you imagine that humanity being born from the Virgin Mary. This is one concept, uh, a particular concept of humanity. And then the only begotten of the Father is another concept. And that these two which unite are no longer named two of that category, but one. And moreover, if you divide them again and examine them according to themselves, then you undo the union, he says. And this is because when they came to be one, it was indissolubly such that it, what? No longer becomes two. two. Yep. St. Cyril talks about this in his own ways, of course. So then he ends it off uh, this portion. Why do you split the saving dispensation thinking of two and canceling the union? We heard um, Subdeacon Zaya, he spoke about how St. Cyril says you can't even say two. So this isn't just St. Cyril. And we'll see that they say it in many ways and not just in the sense of, oh, you can't say two persons. But if you say two, two natures inseparably united, khalas, it's all okay, Habibi. Um, Sam, Sam the, the, like, a, a, like an overarching point is that any saint can say anything, but the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus 431 officially is condemning anyone explicitly saying two natures after the union. Yeah. Period. It doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, that's, and that's, this that's is part of the thing. council. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, so guys understand. Let me hammer this. This is why, guys, take your time. Don't rush. Lord willing, each part will try to keep it two hours because I want this meet because you blew me away. Uh, you've got, given me a greater love and a deeper respect for the Oriental Orthodox. I'm blown away. This is stuff is not taught to me. But now, just for everyone to understand, Nina nailed it. She was thinking like me. The language that they're no, long, no longer two but one, the same language is used of our Lord about Adam and Eve. In Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Let me show you the language that they're using to say when Christ the Word becomes incarnate, it's a composite nature. We don't speak of two anymore. It's one, not because he's not man, not because he's not God, but because they are perfectly united in a composite nature in this person we call Christ. Now, the language... When he was thinking of this, came to my mind, oh, what our Lord said in Matthew 19, and Nina picked up on it. Just want to, guys, understand what they're not saying. Because, you know, you're going to have haters who hate, and they're going to try to slander you, but your words are clear. The example would be this. Now, Jesus, they're not saying he's not divine, he's not human. He's truly divine, truly human, but at the incarnation, the divine and human are a composite nature. They don't fuse, creating a third nature. But they're so perfectly united in him. Now, similar language to what you find at this. He's now giving you what is found at the Council of Ephesus, right? The homily of, of St. Theodotus of Ancyra, so quoting him, approving him, provingly. Now here, Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female? And it said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now look what our Lord says about that union. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now no one thinks that female is no longer female or male is no longer female, but in their union, they become a composite <clears throat> unity. So this is what they're not saying. They're not saying Jesus is not divine, not human, because they fused into each other. No, no. He's divine. He's human. But we speak of one composite nature after the union. So I hope you understand where they're coming from. So go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that, Sam. Um, yeah. Could you go to the next slide maybe? Yeah. And then we'll thank you so much. So um, what's important is that in this particular homily, now, of the three universally accepted homilies that are in 
all of the codexes. There's, for instance, there's a fourth homily that's only preserved in the Ethiopian codex. Uh, so that one, I'm, I'm not using it, but it's very clearly the same mindset as St. Theodotus, and it doesn't say anything that his other homilies don't already say. Um, so the thing is, St. Theodotus and the other co council fathers of the Council of Ephesus, they go in depth into explaining how this no longer to makes make sense, sense or can make sense. Um, and they, they explain it in, from various different angles. And so this is what he does next. Now, all of the quotations from this homily are chronological. So one comes after the other, um, not directly after, because there will be a period in between. But he says here in this, in these two parts that I have kind of concatenated together because he's continuing the same thought process. He says that the only begotten becoming a slave, he remained what he was and became what he was not. Now, this is language that all of our Christological traditions will claim to accept. The question is, how do we accept it? And what St. Theodotus says in order to explain what he is meant by this, by the Orthodox, is that neither can you tell me how the Egyptian river became blood while the nature of the water remained unchanged. That is for the Hebrew. Now, he says, continuing this thought process, how did the Egyptian's river become blood, the nature of the water remaining unchanged? For the Hebrews were using it as water, but for the Egyptians, the Nile became blood and remaining what it was became what it was not. Then he continues with yet another example. And he's very biblical. He keeps using the Old Testament because the fathers inherited these thoughts through these analogies that prefigured Christ in various ways. He says, how did Egypt's light become darkness, not being quenched, but, but made 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 what it was? For it was day to the Israelites and pure light surrounded them. But to the Egyptians... This light was darkness. He says the single visible light, single again, the single visible light, it was simultaneously light and darkness. Light is not darkness and darkness is not light. These are different qualities. These are different essential qualities. But yet the single, which is not two, was simultaneously both because of the nature of how composites work or the, the logos of how composites work not being changed and becoming it. He says a divine miracle occurred. The flame in Babylon became dew. And both are seen in the activity. For the three young men, who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we venerate them all the time in the Coptic Orthodox Church in our hymnography. So this is very important, you see, also to the, the practical liturgical life where we're thinking about these events from the Bible and we are, yeah, we're just digesting it. And he's relating these back to us. They were cooled by the dew, whereas the Babylonians, they were what burned by the flame. And so these are opposite operations that happen within the self-same nature by the grace of God. So what does he conclude with, with all of these analogies? He says that even though the nature of each the nature of God and the nature of man, they do not transform into the other such that their natural quality will be lost. But he says that the intense union of singularity makes it so that there were not two things or two natures, but what was seen was one and the same thing. And he and says that this bear witness, ask not the mode of God's miracles. Point, pointing at the, um, the the indescribability of it and the unapproachability of it because the yes, super yes. comes one did, of us. Did you show the quote of um, where he says, don't listen to them when they try to pretend that they... When yes, they that, that was the super. next one. So the, show, the thing show is, that one and then we're going to move on to yeah. Shema I, we, I need to ask him something for the show. For so, sure. Yeah. Uh, Sam, would, it, would you be able to turn the slide? 
Yes, go ahead, brother. Thank you so much. So he says, following up this, let them say to us, who is they, the Nestorians, they who divide the human being from God's word and who separate what? What was made one? Well, what was made one? What was made one? It was the natures that was made one, the union of two mm. by the recollection of the natures. So if you recall them after they are no longer two as two, then you are dissolving the union. They who say that Christ is two things and for their own defense, provide the one by rationalization alone. Oh, it's one hypostasis. It's one person. It's all okay. It's all okay because we say it's one person. That's not according to St. Theodosius of Inkaira. Um, it, if you want to us to end there or if you want me to explain the other quote, um, it's your call, Subdeacon. Which other quote? The other quote's on the screen below the one that we just went over. Um, let's see. The, for the very reason I admit the same being as God and man, talking about how he's not twofold, and that we cannot. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do, you go ahead and do that. Finish that, the slide, and then we'll do, do we'll go on to Shamasha. For go sure. Ahead. So he says that for this reason, he admits the same being as God and man. On the one hand, God before time, and on the other, a human being coming to be, beginning from the birth. He says though that they are not two but one, and further that they are not to be just declared as one, yet rationalized as twofold. Christ is not twofold. He is not twofold while you merely declare the oneness. And he says even further regarding the union of two natures into one nature that we do not think two and we admit a single one. Now, mm -hmm. single does not mean simple. Single means it is one and not two. Simple mm -hmm. means it is not composed at all. It is completely simple. Um, uh, Simple just means not composed of parts. Let neither word nor concept separate what was joined by dispensation and wonder. Yet, if someone would separate by what rationalization? So you're just pretending that they're no longer two, but you just mean that they're not two persons and you don't actually mean that they aren't two at all. What had been joined, he would think it had been sundered and the concept would become false having separated clearly what has always been joined from the moment of the conception of the Logos in the womb of St. Mary. And he says that it is necessary that we have our concept agreeing with our word, what we profess. Do you say that Christ is one, that the same being is God and human being? Surely then you also think of one Yet if you say one, if you claim that it's one, but yet you rationalize two, then what? You have your concept battling with your word. It's not agreeing with the word anymore. The profession has to be matched in consistency of faith. So do not say two separated by some difference. For if you unite with words, do not sever with concepts. For if you sever with concepts, you, divide, you deny the union. And he's specifically talking about the duality of nature. So that's why he says about all of this, do not say two, do not lead away the reasoning to separated natures in as much as God works the wonder of the extreme union. Perfect. Thank now, you. Uh, before you move on, yeah. so people understand the importance of what you just read. This is from the homily of St. Theodotus of Ancyra, and Syra, however you want to pronounce it. This was what was being affirmed at, both councils at Ephesus. This is what was being affirmed by the Eastern fathers and writers and theologians, especially those who wrote in Syriac, spoke Syriac and heard in Syriac. Do not say two natures, say one nature. This is this is what is being affirmed now. Who is St. Theodo Theodotus so that people understand that he's not just some Joshmo and is he canonized and by whom? So St. Theodotus of Ancyra, the history of his utilization and acceptance um, is twofold because of the uh, the Chalcedonians and the Oriental Orthodox. So uh, Migni in his Patrologia Graeca, volume 77, when he um, basically gives his preface to St. Theodotus of Enchiria, he talks about how scholarships, accu scholars uh, accused him of being like a proto-Eutychian Monophysite heretic. 
And he basically explains how this is impossible because he was accepted by uh, uh, Cronus of Jerusalem, who was a, a Chalcedonian writer in, um, I believe, the in the end of the 6th and the 7th centuries, if I remember correctly. Um, and Sophronius of Jerusalem, he wrote a, uh, an, a lengthy encyclical letter that was accepted by the Third Council of Constantinople. And so the Frankel talks about in his work how St. Theodotus was accepted as a saint. And historically, this, this homily in particular, I believe it's this one, um, if I remember correctly. It was utilized by St. Proclus of Constantinople, a contemporary of his first, uh, in like the 430s. Um, he he borrows extensively from, I believe it's this homily. Uh, and second, this is definitely from this homily, is St. Erechtheus of Antioch in Pisidia, who we have two or three works preserved by him. And in one of those homilies, he was, he was also a writer during like the 430s, 440s period who um, was um, close to the Proclus. And uh, in one of his homilies, again, he so extensively. This is, this is important. It's not necessarily because it's St. Theodotus. Obviously, the saint, what he says is important. But more than that, this is from the Council of Ephesus. This is not negotiable. We can disagree with the saint here or there. Uh, we disagree with with Augustine of Hippo on his Christology. A lot of the EOs do too. Um, but this is an ecumenical council. That's why this and is... And for those wondering, for those wondering, this homily isn't just something that was preached in his home church. And it's like, oh, you know what? I might as well take it to the Council of Ephesus. Because there were, I think, two homilies by St. Theodotus where this very thing happened where he decided to bring them with him. This homily and two other homilies were literally delivered to the Council of Ephesus. That's why he's talking about Nestorianism in it. Is And so this was read in the Council of Ephesus, and they accepted it so much that they included these three homilies in the Acts of the Council of Ephesus. Now, if you look yeah. at the Council of Ephesus, this is the only one who has more homilies than St. Theodotus that are part of the Council of Ephesus is St. Sure. Cyril of Alexandria. Right. Everyone else will have like one homily max, I believe. Okay. So just so I want, because you guys, you've shocked the world here. You shocked me, definitely. Guys, Council of Ephesus, an ecumenical council accepted by the Eastern Orthodox Roman Catholic Church. Up until now, I had no idea. Those at the council, like <clears throat> Cyril of Alexandria and the rest, they're reading homilies and they're making statements affirming one composite nature in Christ, Mia Physitism. Who also believed that and fought for that? Cyril of Alexandria, the man who condemns Nestorius. And I'm shocked out of my mind to discover this for the first time, and I'm 51 years old. And here I'm looking at this, and they're the Eastern Orthodox apologists who must know these facts. They know them. It's not the average Eastern Orthodox. I don't expect them to know this. I mean... I don't know this, and I'm not nowhere a scholar, but I've spent years hearing scholars, and this is the first time in my 20 years of apologetic ministry. I'm not lying to you. First time. I've been doing apologetics, what, since 1999? I've read Scott, and this is the first time I'm hearing with such articulation and proofs, proofs. They're giving you proofs from the council and statements from the council that even Cyril of Alexandria, all these men affirm Miaphysitism, and they argued for Miaphysitism. So that means the Eastern Orthodox scholars, apologists, the Roman Catholic scholars and apologists must know this, but they're not Miaphysites. So why are they affirming this council? And why did they canonize St. Cyril as a saint? I am baffled as heck, but go ahead. All right. So uh, I can, brother, uh, I want you to tell us, before we go to Shamasha, Zaya, about... Uh, Chalcedon and the Church of the East. Uh, I want you to 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 seg to segue that, uh, talking about Leo, Leo of Rome, and his Christological quotes, how they are at odds with Cyril explicitly. He says the opposite thing that what Cyril says. Um, do you have that? I showed that for Theodora already. I showed Theodora and, um, 
I hope had, someone's not in the bathroom, dude. Sounds like someone come on scaring me now with that noise. I can. You ready? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Sam, can I share my screen? You can as long as well. That was breathing noises you were making because you're freaking me out, dude. No, no, no. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> hey, where's your screen? Let me share. All right, let me see. All right. Uh, do you see it? Yep, right there. There it goes. Okay. So the Tome of Leo, a document written by Leo uh, of Rome, Pope Leo. Obviously, Daniel talked about this a lot, and he explained the background. And so, obviously, us Oriental Orthodox, we object to it. Why is that? It's because it taught diophysitism, the very thing that we say was condemned by the Council of Ephesus. And so I have here a couple uh, slides that I want to show, which show a comparison between the Tome of Leo and the Church Fathers. And not just those at Ephesus, but also prior church fathers, those who are venerated by, by the Eastern Orthodox, by the Roman Catholics, by the Church of the East even. And so here's one of the first parts that I can talk about. Here we see the, in the Tome of Leo. What is, what Leo, is, conde what is what Leo condemning is, Eutyches for? What is Eutyches' heresy? Here he explains it. Eutyches' heresy is saying that Christ was from Two natures and one nature after the union. One nature after the word became flesh. This is what Leo is upset about. He sees Eutyches as a heretic for this. Now, I want to compare this to a statement from St. Cyril of Alexandria, where St. Cyril is responding to St. Akakius. St. Akakius is another father from the Council of Ephesus. And he, they worked together a lot and they spoke a lot. And I'll even talk about that a lot more further on. Now, in this quote, St. Cyril says... We speak of two natures being united, but after the union, the, du the duality has been abolished. The duality, the twofoldness, the two natures have been abolished, and we believe the son's nature to be one. Why? Since he is one son. So here, St. Cyril is connecting the, the idea of one nature to one son. If there's one nature, there would be one son. If there's one son, there would be one nature. And the context for this is even that St. Akakius says the same thing. Oh. In St. Akakius' letter to St. Cyril, uh, the first letter he ever wrote, um, he talks about how there are certain people in the East, uh, speaking of two natures after the union, each one performing what belongs to it. This is what he says in the letter, and I'll show this letter in a bit. And so how does St. Cyril respond? As we see here, two natures were united, but after the union, there is one nature because the duality has been abolished. The very same thing that Leo is condemning Eutyches for. Eutyches said two natures, from two natures, a union happened, but one nature after the union. And Leo is upset about this. And so here we're going to examine another very, very important quote from the Tome of Leo. This is one of the most controversial quotes, I want to say. No, uh, no other quote compares to this one in terms of uh, how problematic it is. Leo says in the Tome, for each form, which means nature, each form does what is proper to it in cooperation with the other. So he sees two natures cooperating with one another in their actions. And he, then he clarifies the word. God, the word, performs what, uh, what pertains to the word, and the flesh performs what pertains to the flesh. One of them sparkles with miracles, and the other succumbs to, energy, to injuries. So the word is doing his own actions, the flesh is doing its own actions, and this is two natures, each performing what belongs to it. This was written in around, I believe, uh, 447 AD. 447 AD. If we go 20 years prior, around uh, 430 AD-ish, St. Akakius wrote a letter to St. Cyril. This is the letter that I mentioned so much. This is a very important letter. He, asks, he writes to St. Cyril and he says, I write your reverence for all. Let everyone be forced to publicly anathematize. Anathematize means to condemn. Condemn the dogmas of Nestori Nestorius and Theodore. Obviously, you know who Theodore is. Uh, mm -hmm. Theodore is. Theodore of Mopsuestia, the teacher of Nestorius. Uh, I can. Uh, Tell me if I'm wrong. Wow. Isn't this quote from Acacius of Melitene, is it at the Council of Ephesus or is it a personal to Cyril? 
It's uh, it's personal. Okay. Um, it was four thirty three. Um, yes. Okay. Got. Oh, this is after the formula of reunion. That's right. This letter is specifically in regards to the four thirty three agreement, and Saint Beautiful. Cyril confirms his faith. Yes. Yes. Even perfectly. Better. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So this he tells uh, Saint Cyril, please condemn the dogmas of Nestorius and Theodore. What are these dogmas? What what does Nestorius and Theodore teach? Those who say to natures after the union properly, each one working. Hmm. Mm. Does that sound familiar? Especially to natures though. after the union, properly, each one working, mm. each one performing its own actions. Guys, look at the quote on the top of the slide, and look at the quote in the middle of the slide. Yeah, these are opposites. Wow. And how does Saint Cyril respond to this? He says. He was delighted by this letter. He was delighted. And in this letter, I need to show it all. Uh, maybe if I can, maybe at a later time. But there's so much in it that talks about this. And St. Akakius, he condemns these dogmas as the same thing as teaching two sons. And that's why St. Cyril said earlier, we believe, the sons, we believe that the son's nature is one since he is one son. So there's a connection between the number of sons and the number of natures for both of them. These are the fathers of the Council of Ephesus. This is what Ephesus taught. Though the three presiding fathers, if you look at the list of the, the attendees, uh, the people who attended the Council of Ephesus, first off, you'll see Cyril, then Theodotus, and then Akakius. Very, very, very big names. Okay. And another quote I wanted to include, this is from St. Mark the Ascetic. Keep in mind, you're going to hear a lot about uh, how there's an Antiochian school and an, Alex and, an Alexandrian school. school. Yeah, a school of Antioch and a school of Alexandria. And they say that the school of Antioch tended towards Nestorianism and the school of Alexandria tended towards uh, Miaphysitism. But this is, I I'd say, a false narrative. Why? Because St. Mark the Ascetic was from Antioch. He was an, an Antiochian priest and he's venerated by all churches, by the way. He has very, very good ascetical writings writings on spirituality and etc. And he even decided to write, write a gigantic uh, work against Nestorius. It's called On the Incarnation Against Nestorius. And what does he say in it against Nestorius? Nowhere do, does it, the scriptures, say that his humanity, humanity suffered something, something or God, God the Word did something. So there's no humanity doing its own actions and God the Word doing its own actions. He believes that they're so united that there's only one Thing working. There's only one individual doing actions. Wow. It says everywhere in scripture, rather, that he claimed the deeds of the flesh as his own, not only on earth in the here and now, but also in heaven forever. So all the actions of God the Word are in the flesh. We cannot say uh, this did that and that did, that did this. We have to say there is one nature working, one nature performing all the actions, one subject of the incarnation. Um, Sam, so, yeah, so let me expound on what is being said for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can say something, I can honestly say this was such a blessing for me to hear this, and I can't wait to hear it all because I'm saying this. I know I'm gonna upset a lot of people. I am blown away by what you're presenting from the Eastern Church leading up to the fifth century, and that even those accepted as saints. And the Roman Catholic Church <laughs> and then the Eastern Orthodox Church. So it's Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox. Accepted as saints say, after the union, you do not speak of two natures anymore. You speak of one nature. That's mind-blowing. I mean, and with the Cyril, you really blew me away. But now let me explain what they're saying, what the response to Nestorius was. In the scripture, you won't find the scripture saying, and Jesus ate as a man. And Jesus raised the dead. Because of God, they don't differentiate by the operation of which nature is Jesus doing something. Is he eating because he's a man or is he raising there because he's God? No. All those actions actions are attributed, attributed to one person. <laughs> so that you can say Jesus created the heavens and the earth because he did. But we know that the name Jesus is applied to him when he became flesh. But they didn't care because it's one person, right? Possesses these natures you speak of, Jesus creating them in the earth. Or you can say that God shed his blood. Well, God is spirit. He doesn't have blood. They didn't make that <laughs> distinction, differentiation. That's what the response is. And nowhere in the scripture 
do they so distinguish the natures that when he does something, they say, oh, that was the man doing it. Or that's the divinity part. No, no. It's that one person who's performing all these actions. So we should not so divide the natures so that we speak of Jesus eating as a man and then Jesus raising the dead as God. No, no, no. Jesus ate and Jesus raises the dead and Jesus created the heavens and the earth and Jesus was buried. Yeah. That's what he's trying to say to the stories. So we have a, we have a, a saint, uh, Sam. His name is Marcioerios Tagetsurai, the crown of the Assyrians. Marcio, we call him. This saint, saint, they call him in the West, Saint Severus. Um, <laughs> he said, he said, it is foreign to the divine nature to have feet, and it is foreign to the human nature to walk on water. So which nature walked on the water? The one incarnate nature of the Lord walked on the water. Uh, it says the same about um, sleeping on the boat. God doesn't sleep, and human can't calm the storm. So who did who calmed the storm? But is the one in the water. <coughs> oh. yeah. Exactly. So yep. Yeah. So so mm -hmm. it's uh it's it's still disheartening because it's sad that we cannot unite. Because if you heard what Saint uh, Shemash Isaiah said, and I know you're going to let him speak, because poor guy sitting there, he's like, of "I course. need to you guys." Okay. Yeah, he's, he's uh, if, you, if you heard what Saint uh, Shem, Saint Shemash Isaiah, maybe one day you'll be a saint, and I'll pray to you and ask you to intercede for me. But I don't know. Shemash Isaiah said, he's saying that the reason why you'll find, and this is not just the Assyrian Church, this is also the Roman Catholic Eastern Orthodox Church. They'll say like Christ was born as a man. We do that in order to make sure that the enemies of the gospel like the muslims don't think that we're saying that god somehow in becoming flesh is now less divine and god as god can die this is why we're safe we use such terminology but anyway go ahead brother i just wanted to clarify people yeah, thank, thank you sam we're gonna get to uh shamash as a uh, thank you i can for the presentation i know it's not done we're going to finish it next time we we come on with with sam and Sean. oh yeah we're going to have several sure, parts sure yeah. no, no problem so no problem so uh, uh what he was getting to what i can was getting to is uh he was going to show you where leo he says the one who said the father is greater than i is not the same as the one who said i and the father are one that's where this was leading wait wait who said who said that leo leo said that wait leo said what again I the the one who said I and the Father are one is not the same who said the Father is greater than I. Please let me see that. Uh, let me see that quote. I'm gonna put it on the screen. I gotta see that quote. Hold on. Let me see that. Do you have it? You're gonna bring it up now. You said. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna shock me with that one. Go ahead. Go ahead. This is in the tome of Leo. Right there. It is not yes. part of the same Verbatim. nature to say I and the Father are one. And to say the father is greater than I. Okay. Now I understand. I understand. So he's saying that one nature is saying the father is greater than I. The other nature, the nature is saying father. something. Yeah. What yeah. is that? Yeah. Nature? Yeah. The and notice. Yeah. Notice. I want you guys to notice. Each nature is calling him the father. Each nature has a father. That means each that means nature is, is a son. Right. Yeah. One is an equal son, a son equal to his father, and the other is a son lesser than his father. Let me let me break it down for people so they understand. I got your point now. Now, remember, guys, and I'm saying this to bless you guys, bless your sharp minds, but we're trying to learn. So let me explain what you just brought out, the implication. When Pope Leo says it's not the same nature that says I am the father one, and the father is greater than I, what he means is, <laughs> it's what he means. Jesus because he's man, the Father is greater than him. But Jesus, because he's God, he's equal to the Father. But now understand what they're saying. This is what happens. And I'm not saying all Eastern Orthodox. Eastern Orthodox, I have a lot of you. You know, I love you. I love the church. I'm not here. I'm done about those extreme because we got fanatics in every branch of Christianity. Catholics, Assyrian fanatics that are disgraceful. This is what happens when you want to be uncharitable. And you want to split hairs, you can nitpick and then condemn you of Nestorianism because you see what he's saying. But hold on, natures don't speak, persons do. So, how can he say it's one nature saying one thing and another nature saying another? Are you saying they're two persons? Therefore, are you Nestorian? You understand? Not, Sam, he's saying 
if, imagine both natures are talking about the father. They, they yes. both call the father the father. So, so then how many both. sons are there? Okay. So if there's one son, then how can it be the human nature saying father is greater mm -hmm. than I? Is he now a second son? In other words, they're showing you what happens. You can end up being condemned as Nestorian. Aha. Poor Assyrians have been being bashed for being Nestorians, and now the shoe's on the other foot. Go ahead, brother. <laughs> Okay, uh, Shamasha, uh, sorry for the gap in time, huh? So we wanted to ask you, and obviously, guys, this is all going to continue. All of us will be back another time. But uh, Shamasha, um, uh, we wanted to ask you what the Church of the East view is of the Council of Chalcedon. Can you tell us? Yeah, all right. uh, thank you. So in Chalcedon, even among the Chalcedonians, you have to be specific on which school of Chalcedonians you're talking about, right? Because there's also Neo-Chalcedonians that come at Constantinople too, which we would disagree with, but the, the true, true Chalcedonianism God. is found in the Tome of Leo. So when we're speaking of Chalcedonianism, we're looking at the Tome of Leo. We're not looking at pro, the Proto-Chalcedonian, Neo-Chalcedonian school, sorry, that came after him, the New Chalcedonians. So we look strictly at Leo, not with the council after says that contradicts him so mm. i'll before i get into what the church of these things i want to look at what nestorius thinks so Please. nestorius nestorius himself saying Nestorius himself he says in one of his homilies that now i'll just read the quote it's not that long for we know not two christ or sons or only begottens or lords nor one and another son nor an original and new only begotten nor a first and a second christ but one and the same who is visible in the invisible and the visible nature, can a man, when he hears these things, say that something else was said by him and those at Chalcedon by Leo? So Nestorius makes an appeal to Chalcedon and Leo. Read it one more time, Shamasha. Read it slowly, no one more time. If, if so, you want me, I, I had the text, so I can bring it up. Yes, like, put it on the screen. Put it on the screen. I, Guys, I don't have it. Uh, I, don't have it. Put it up. I, I have it, so I can do that. Okay, do that, because I want you to hear. Guys, Nestorius agrees with Pope Leo, the Tome of Leo, regarding that there are not two persons. Watch here. One more time. Is that the slide? I don't have Yes, I think it's the third slide. But I can it's the first right one. To, uh, okay, whoever wants to read it, read it. <laughs> okay, well, we uh, know yes, not two so, Christ okay. or sons or only begotten or lords nor one and another son, nor an original and a new only begotten, nor a first and a second Christ, but one and the same who is visible in the invisible and the visible nature. Can a man, when he hears these things, say that something else was said by him and by those at Chalcedon and by Leo? For openly he is bold and knows the same Christ who is visible in the invisible and the visible nature, nor has said two Christ and two sons and Lord. And the council of Chalcedon said, one and the same Christ, son, Lord, only begotten in two natures, not changeably, nor confusedly, nor divisibly. Nestorius yeah. Constantinople. Yeah, so Nestorius appealed to Chalcedon. So we know that within the controversy, Nestorius himself did not see Chalcedon as saying something foreign, as a lot of people make it seem that he rejected Chalcedon or what Leo said or what we would reject what Leo said, which isn't the case, which you see Nestorius appeals to him. And then even after that, um, way after Chalcedon, at the time of Marbaba the Great, Marbaba the Great, he himself also uh, goes to Leo. So Baba says, as the blessed Leo, and this is in the Book of Union, he says, as the blessed Leo, the Bishop of Rome and the and Theodore, so he connects him to Theodore, Theodore the Interpreter and all the other Orthodox Fathers distinguish the natures and attributes of their properties to the same unity of the one Christ, the one Son. So we've established now that two Fathers, that the Church of these views as Fathers, have accepted Leo. So we believe that the Christology of Chalcedon, which is the Christology found in the Tome of Leo, is 100% Orthodox and is what's found in the writings of Nestorius and what's found in the writings of Babai and Theodore. Irony, huh? Yeah, and... Can I hear that? 
So wait, Shabbat you're saying Nestorius, Nestorius agreed with the Tome of Pope Leo, agreed with what the Council of Chalcedon said about Christ. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, 100%. He appealed to it. And they also, so we also see that even people that were, as uh, Shamasha Daniel explained earlier, Theodore himself was a friend of Nestorius from the same teacher. And he, when he's at the council, he says, I've always been Orthodox. And my fathers, referring to Theodore and Theodore, have always been Orthodox. So we see that even someone with Nestorius' exact beliefs, who doesn't recant his beliefs, he never changes his beliefs, he said, These have, what I believe has always been Orthodox, was accepted mm -hmm. in the council. So there's, even, there's a link between Nestorius and Chalcedon through Theodore and through his acceptance by appealing and I showed, to I showed in the comments... Theodore is quoting Nestorius in defense of Chalcedon after Chalcedon, meaning yeah, exactly. Theodore is still using Nestorius as orthodox. You guys Chalcedon. hearing this? Okay. You guys who've been bashing the Assyrians and Nestorius, you guys, you know who you are, not everyone, I'm just saying. Do you hear this? Not only does Nestorius say, amen, I fully accept the Tome of Leo, what Council of Chalcedon says in 451, but after the Council... Theodoret, or Theo, however you pronounced it, yeah. he's quoting what Nestorius says to show that Nestorius confirms the Council of Chalcedon. Now, I'm going to exactly. ask all of you guys a question. Don't these apologists and these scholars of theirs know these facts? And if they do, why then do they still condemn the Assyrian church without mercy? So can so, I answer this one? Or? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, so a lot of... Uh scholars you'll find if you read they use terms like proto-chalcedonian and neo-chalcedonian so the chalcedonians you see now like like for example the the eastern orthodox online they would fall under neo-chalcedonianism a chalcedonianism that comes at constantinople too that condemns the three chapters of chalcedon which a saint in eastern orthodoxy and roman catholicism calls them the three ch uh, chapters of chalcedon which would be isidore so that's one tradition, Neo-Chalcedonianism, which is its own thing, completely separate from the Proto-Chalcedonianism and Ephesus. It's a mix of both. Then you have the Proto-Chalcedonian position, which would be the Church of the East position, which was more predominant in the Latin tradition, like Isidore of Seville and other figures that say the three chapters being Theodore of Mopsuestia, Theodore, and Ibas are all Orthodox. Right, so oh. then you have those two contradicting schools within what you would group under the umbrella of Chalcedonianism. So that's why you often see Chalcedonians today, um, like the those accepted acceptant of Constantinople too, condemning the Church of the East awesome. because they have their own thing altogether. Right, so it's Absolutely. completely different from the original truth of Chalcedon, which Nestorius accepted. It's its own thing. You see people in that school. Uh, like I believe it's Anastasius of Antioch. He, for example, he says that the humanity of Jesus Christ is a universal. It's not a particular. So that leads to the position that basically all of humanity was incarnated when God the Word took uh, incarnated, took on all of humanity because it's universal to universal humanity, all of mankind. Now, which no. Chalcedon says no. no. Oh. Leo uses two substances. Which would be basically two kanume. Yeah, I say. Yeah. I say. Yeah. Before I give Daniel a final word, uh, so just so people know, con second, the Second Council of Constantinople, Constantinople two. What year? Five fifty three. Okay, so I want everyone to understand the original position at the Council of Chalcedon, Chalcedon, Chalcedon. Some say Chalcedon, four fifty one. The story is fully affirms, and he's in agreement with. Constantinople, Constantinople II, about 100 years later, 553, there they decide to condemn, and you mentioned three individuals. So 100 years later, individuals at the Council of Chalcedon who are viewed as being Orthodox are now condemned as heretics 100 years later? Exactly, yes. Uh, so look so, what happens. Oh, go ahead, Zaya. You go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I was going to say, we have Ebas who's accepted at Chalcedon, and in the letter of Ebas, he venerates Theodore. So 
through that, we can say that Theodore was accepted at Chalcedon. Then you have Theodore who came into Chalcedon saying, I've always been Orthodox, and they accept that. These mm. three individuals that are tied to uh, uh, quote-unquote Nestorianism are condemned 100 years after. So it's one council contradicting it, another oh. council again. So three councils in a row, Ephesus, Chalcedon, <laughs> Constantinople too, that just miss, completely miss each other. So, so you guys hear it. I want you to hear it. An ecumenical council, 451, affirms the orthodoxy of these three individuals. Theodore Mopsustia, and I know you're going to have some quotes from him in part two, God willing. And then uh, I, I say it, Theodoret. You go, Thea, Theodoret. All right. And then I couldn't understand the third name. The third name Ibas. was? Ibas. 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 Yeah. They were Orthodox. Another council comes, which the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholics consider to be ecumenical, condemning the three that an earlier council affirmed as Orthodox. Because of this later council condemning the three, that's where the condemnation of the Assyrians really plays a factor because right. if you go with just Council of Chalcedon, if you just stick with 451, the Assyrian church says, amen, absolutely, we accept. Nestoria says, amen, absolutely, I agree. So if you go by the Council of Chalcedon, Assyrians are not heretics, neither is Nestorius. Are you hearing what the, they're telling you? Okay. Uh, go this, ahead. This is where, uh, Sam, this is where now imperial powers begin to play a role. Mm. Emperors on the Roman and Persian side of the border, now they have interest in this. And this is why it leads up to what happens in the 6th century. So after 451, the, the emperor, he... Yeah, we're going to talk Qais al Ghassani. <laughs> By the way, you're a Ghassanid. My dad's side are Ghassasina. They're going to show you the facts, and when they prove that let me, you're, let me teach you. you're let me teach you. I'm going to muzzle you and send the shit after you. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so after 451, within, within 20 four years of the Council of Chalcedon, all the Eastern Seas revert to non-Chalcedonianism. And because of that, the emperor is scared. He wants to unify the empire. You know, this Chalcedon thing separated everybody. So what does he do? There is a, something called the Henoticon of Zeno, the emperor. And in this time, Chalcedon is rejected. And the East is united upon non-Chalcedonianism for the next 40 years. Now, in that time, in 484 AD, the Persian king, the Shah, he hates the Roman Empire. And they hate each other back and forth. So again, it's not the problem is not Afinwati Surai. The problem is the Persians in this case, the, the emperor, the, the king of the of Iran. He has he has our our last Catholicos patriarch of the Church of the East in communion with Antioch, Marbawe, in the sixth century, four eighty four uh, sorry, fifth century, four eighty four died. He was killed, the Shah killed him. He, inst he, he put instead of him somebody who's going to affirm uh, Chalcedon and two natures because the, the, the Roman side of the border are not affirming Chalcedon and two natures at this time in 484. Okay? Uh, Peter the Fuller was patriarch of Antioch. Now, moving forward. So again, non-Chalcedonianism within 20 years of Chalcedon. Nobody's Chalcedonian. Uh, moving forward, uh, the Henoticon era also non-Chalcedonian. 518, Justin the Italian, the Latin, he comes into power in the Roman side of the border. He's emperor. He wants to reconcile Italy. The libellus of Armistice happens. Sam, listen to this. He has everybody sign. Whoever wants to keep his place as a bishop has to sign. Whoever dies outside of communion with Rome, even if they're Chalcedonian, is anathema and removed from the ditics. Even if they're Chalcedonian, if they die outside of communion with Rome, they have to be removed from the diptychs. This is the Labellus of Hormisdas, it's called. Okay. Now, uh, moving forward from this, St. Severus is exiled. All, the, all the, the Oriental Orthodox bishops are exiled at this time. Moving forward, the, uh, Justin, Justinian, his nephew, now becomes emperor. He tries to reconcile the non-Chalcedonians. In 536, 532 to 533, he's trying to reconcile 
They go to the council. Pope Agapetus of Rome is there. It's a big thing. Uh, St. Severus's writings are condemned. They start to burn them, etc. This is This is what they used to call, this was the fifth council. Then they changed their mind. 536. 553, 553, like, like uh, Shamash Isaiah said, they condemn Theodore of Mopsuestia's person, Sam, his person, but they don't, they for Theodora and Ibas, they don't condemn their persons, they condemn their writings. Why? Mm. Why, Why they condemn their persons, they condemn their writings? Because they can't, because they can't contradict Chalcedon. Chalcedon exonerated them. They can't be like, we condemn them because they would be contradicting. It's like, we don't condemn their persons, we condemn their writings. Imagine having a saint and you can't read anything he wrote. So they condemn the writings of the two, but they still don't want to condemn them. But Theodore, they condemned to the pit of hell. Yes. I also now, want to say, sorry now, to interrupt. Now, now, in the West, because they have brains, in the West, they're like, that doesn't make any sense. You guys are contradicting Chalcedon. We reject the Fifth Council. The Western, the Western uh, Chalcedonians, the Latins today, they rejected the Fifth Council. A lot of them did. There was a huge schism in the yeah, West. Yeah, I just want to say real quick, though. So to back that up, there's a Latin... He's a saint for both Eastern Orthodox and for the Roman Catholics. His name is Isidore of Seville. And Isidore of Seville. So say it again. Isidore, Isidore of Seville, Isidore a recognized canonized saint for the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics. Okay. And the Roman Catholics. So in his chronicon, uh, in his chronicles, he writes, he's talking about Emperor Justinian. Justinian ruled for 39 years, receiving the heresy of the Akephali. He compelled, he compelled every bishop in his kingdom to condemn the three chapters of the Council of Chalcedon. So he's three saying chapters. that the three chapters, Theodore, Ebus, and Theodore, are of Chalcedon, meaning they're of Chalcedon, and that Justinian compelled the bishops. He compelled them to condemn it. They didn't want to condemn it. He compelled This is them. their saint talking, yeah, Sam. He's a saint. And he's a, so, so, so look, the, uh, this letter of Ebus that I mentioned earlier, they accept as orthodox. It says Cyril is an Apollinarian and he repented. It says it in the letter. They accept it at Chalcedon. And then in 553, they say, no, we, we condemn the letter. And it's important to note also, yes, in regards to the Theodorette comment that our friend in the comments section made. Um, by the way, for this history that Subdeacon Daniel has been explaining, I recommend a, a show called... Um, the Patriarchate of Antioch that Subdeacon Daniel and myself did some time back on the Lion's Den channel. And then later that day, His Holiness, the Patriarch oh, of Antioch, blessed the show and yeah. uh, blessed us His for the Holiness show. So blessed by the church. Share the link. Share the link if you can in the uh, private chat, and I'll link to it. I'll share it. So, my, so my, my your session was blessed. Patriarch of Antioch, he, he, uh, he watched the episode, and he blessed us for that. Glory to God. So he blessed that show. So the patriarch himself approved it. So we gotta send the link in the private chat, and I'll share it in my. Well, you're you're a mod, so you can share it yourself, uh, Daniel. Okay. And you, so you, the sorry. The, no good. Theodoret no, no. of Cyrus of uh, yeah Cyrus. And so, uh, in in regards to you know, oh, it was only his writings, not his person. Uh, this individual is forgetting something very important, actually, and that is that in five thirty two. There was a conference between the Orthodox Severian bishops, followers of St. Severus, the Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch, and uh, the Chalcedonians. And the Chalcedonians got their butt handed to them so bad that one of the leaders of the Chalcedonians, St. Anthemus of Trebizond, who was leading the Chalcedonians, ended up converting yeah, to right side yeah. Yeah. And during this 532 conference, Justinian, the emperor himself, when brought with the, this is really when he started to dislike the three chapters when he realized how much of an impetus it would be for them to at least feign orthodoxy. Uh, the Justinian himself was willing in that conference to condemn not only the writings but also the persons of Theodoret and Ebus of Edessa. And so the idea that oh, it's only his writings, well. Uh, First off, when we say Theodoret is condemned, we're using the term in a in in a in a sense which is indicating that his teaching is condemned, and so uh, that his views are condemned at least. But even then, 
as it regards his literal person, Justinian himself was very open to that. And he was willing to do it on the flip of a dime. Um, but they, uh, the Chalcedonians made uh, incom requests of us incompatible with the Orthodox faith. That's amazing. You have shocked the world. You shocked me. And I'm now wondering to myself, honestly, and we're going to have to wrap it up in a few minutes because I got another show coming up. But Lord willing, let me know if you can do Friday or whatever. I'm open Friday onwards. May the Lord open that door. We don't get Satan attacking. We got to do a part two and three, as many parts as you need. But I am still baffled. If the Eastern Orthodox scholars and the Roman Catholic scholars and apologists know this. They know this. Why then do they accept the Council of Ephesus? And why do they accept certain individuals that taught Miaphysitism most famously? I mean, the one that's always been used to mention as an arch enemy of Nestorius, St. Cyril of Alexandria. He's a Miaphysite. You, you quoted him. I mean, you can't, it's right there. You didn't make up any forged statements. So he didn't hold to the Miaphysite, you know, he's a Miaphysite. How is he then still a saint? I. So this is this is Sam. This is why the EOs disagree with each other because their their traditions are conflicting. So you have you have EOs who hold to like you know more of a a, a single subject Christology. You have EOs who have the double subject. Uh, you know um, I don't want to name the personalities, but everybody knows who I'm talking about on both sides of the fight there between the EOs with each other. Um, they're trying to get each other that's communicated. And this is a historical thing. There's 1,500 years they can't agree with each other. Like, okay, uh, in, in, uh, in the 5th and 4th and 6th centuries, there's there's a prayer we say in the liturgy. I'm sure you know sure, it. Knows. It's called the Tri-Sagi. So we say, Right? So when we say it, in the Syrian Orthodox tradition, it's crystal it's Christological. It's not Trinitarian. So when we're saying the, the Trisagion, we're saying the holy, immortal, almighty God was crucified for us. That's what we say. Hmm. On their side, when they came to ask the, the, the Neo-Chalcedonians, as Shamasha correctly called them, the Neo-Chalcedonians, when they went to go ask the Pope of Rome, hey, can we say God suffered for us? What did Hormistus, Pope Hormistus, what did he tell them? He told them, of course you can't. Hmm. You can't say God suffered for us. So they're fighting each other. We have a saint, his name, Amar Aksenaya. He said, at least Rome is honest about their Nestorianism. Not like the Neo-Chalcedonians, they try to hide it. Oh, he said that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, guys, this now gives me an even greater appreciation for the Roman Catholic Church embracing the Assyrian church. Now, if you guys paid attention, you have my permission. Take this session. You can upload it. You can translate. It's yours. And obviously the people here, it's theirs. They can do it as they deem fit. It turns out that the Roman Catholic church in coming to an agreement with the Assyrian church of these, because 1994, Martin IV, that shows that they've been more consistent and honest with their convictions and their view of the Council of Chalcedon and subsequent to it to embrace them and not condemn them as heretics. Because if you're going to be honest, my brothers, let me just share it with you. This is my final words. If you're going to be honest with what took place at the Council of Ephesus, and you're going to be honest with what took place at the Council of Chalcedon, if you're going to be honest, you have no right to condemn the Assyrian church anymore. None whatsoever. Only those who don't accept these councils. The Orient Orthodox don't accept Council of Chalcedon. You know, You don't accept it. Absolutely not. And substance. So they're in a position to say, no, well, we can say you're all heretics. They can do that. But if you're going to accept the Council of Ephesus and you're going to accept Cyril of Alexandria and these others, and then you're going to have at a council that you accept, Council of Chalcedon, where Nestorius is affirming, I believe the Tome of Leo and I believe what he said. And then afterwards, the statement of Nestorius is cited to show that he agrees with the Council of Chalcedon. You can't condemn the Assyrians anymore. That ship has sailed. Time to say bye-bye. Stop condemning the Church of the East. If you do so, I'm going to have to say you're very dishonest before God, and you'll answer to the Lord. It's the conclusion I come to. Now, brethren, any final words? Because we're going to wrap up. Thank you again so much, Sam. 
uh, Basima Raba, we will see you That's soon great. and then uh, we'll be in touch. Thank yes. you so much for the opportunity. Yeah, thank like you said, for having us. Please, if you no, can, my pleasure, man. Thank you, you so much, you. Mr. Shamoon. If, if, you can, if you can link our channel, please, that would be yes, very I will. Helpful. I'm going to put in the description box right after I'm done. Now, like I said, my schedule will be open for Friday onwards. You let me know, Lord willing, and we'll take it from there because we got to get part two done as soon as possible because people, you see, they're hungry. They're like blown away. For, for reference, yeah. Mr. Shamoon, the, we went through about four, five pages of the presentation, including two basically title pages. The mm -hmm. entire thing is 36 pages, and it's probably going to go a lot longer. Six, seven, I don't care. Let's finish it. Take your time. I want it to be so thorough that anyone who comes to refute you is going to have to be meticulous in dealing with your citations. Beautiful. All right. So Christ is risen, risen indeed. And I love you guys. We are brothers in Christ. And I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit in us, we will be together forever before the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. So God bless Amen. you guys. Take care. God bless you. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. See you guys in 30 minutes for my next stream. Lord willing. Awesome.